Hello and welcome. You're watching Coronavirus Facts vs. Myths. I'm Rishika Barwa. The World Health Organization in its weekly review has focused extensively on the B1617 variant first found in India. This is, remember, a variant that's now in 44 countries. So what does the World Health Organization say about this variant of concern? It says that the B1617 has a higher rate of transmission and a reduced susceptibility to neutralization antibodies, which essentially means that this is a variant that could, could potentially cause reinfection in a recovered patient or in a vaccinated individual with antibodies. The WHO also talks about two lineages to the 617 variant, the 6171 and the 6172. The question is whether vaccines will work against them. What does the WHO say? It says that this is something that remains uncertain. The World Health Organization has interestingly cited studies to show that Pfizer and Moderna have shown reduced effectiveness against the variants in India. WHO has also acknowledged in this paper the low level of genome testing in India, which is approximately only about 0.1% of positive samples. Joining us on the show today is uh, one of the foremost voices to understand what is gene sequencing, to understand what these variants mean. Dr. Anurag Agarwal, a physician scientist and the director of uh, CSIR, Institute of Genomics and Integrative Biology, Delhi. Thanks so much, Dr. Agarwal, uh, for being with us. You've been very busy. Uh, but I want to begin by asking you about the B617. Uh, explain to our viewers what is this variant that has emerged first in India? Why is it a variant of concern? Thanks, Vishika. I'm very glad to be on your show. Let me start by explaining what a variant is, because without that, I don't think the answer will be clear. Now, as you know, SARS-CoV-2 is an RNA virus. All these viruses mutate when they replicate. This particular virus has no very high rate of mutation, but since so many people are infected, there have been so many replications, mutations come. Now, every time we sequence the virus, which means we read all its 30 KB nucleic acid bases, we find mutations. Now, once in a while, some mutation might be beneficial to the virus and might allow it to propagate better. And these particular mutations you see coming again and again, there's a word for it called convergent evolution. The same mutation can be found in various parts of the world. And when you find a particular set of mutations growing, you call it a variant. Now, there have been many variants. This is not the first variant. Some variants are, you know, of only inquiry and interest and some variants are of concern. When is a variant, which basically means accumulation of a set of mutations compared to the old one of concern, it has to have either increased transmissibility or it must have increased severity or it must have immune escape or vaccine breakthrough properties. Right. Then we call these things variants of concern. Mm -hmm. Now, when you see these letters A, B, you see these numbers, it basically is something called pangolin a particular type of lineage. The original one from Wuhan was A. Last year, a mutation called D614G. Whenever I use these words, it means N amino acid, the first letter, okay. at a particular position in a gene, in this case, spike position, right. 614, gets converted to another amino acid, in this case, G, took over the world. This particular D614G mutation is now seen in almost every sample. So even when we had the outbreaks in September and November, they were all D614G. Right. It was not a variant of concern because it did not do anything more. Hmm. Now, B.1 basically means you're coming from that lineage. Right. Dot 617 is a particular variant that we saw in Maharashtra for the first time, sequenced in the month of February, confirmed in the month of March, announced by the third week of March as a variant of potential significance and from an outbreak starting in January. Right. So within three months, we went from an outbreak to a variant. Okay. And this is the one that it is. I'll stop here so you can ask the question. Yes. My, my question, therefore, is now we are given to understand that the 617 further has a 1 and 2. Are these faster strains? And how concerned should we be about the transmissibility of this variant? So the original one in Maharashtra was 617.1. So every time, you know, it divides further, you add a, another number to it. So dot one was transmissible. There is no doubt about it by now. 
we can see that in Maharashtra, it really went very fast. That was accompanied by research from BJ Medical College, National Institute of Virology, showing that 617.1 was the dominant strain. Hmm. When it came to Delhi and in the Maharashtra at the same time, 617.2 became faster rising than 617.1. Right. Basically, there is only one major difference. Uh, there is a mutation called E484Q in 617.1. That was part of what we referred to at that time, wrongly, as a double mutant. There are multiple mutations. Right. It just happened that two mutations, L452R and E484Q, caught our eyes for their potential for immune escape. Okay. Now, so, four, 617.2 has lost the E484Q. Okay. There is no more E484Q. So it's only a single mutant using the original technology, original technology which is wrong, but, but has gained a new one called T478K. Okay. Uh, you know, just to simplify all of this for our viewers, what this essentially means is that this variant has the potential to cause a reinfection in people who have been infected with COVID before and in people who have got the vaccine. Do I understand that correctly? Yeah. So let me say that even before these variants came, a person who was infected had a 80% protection at six months by the SARM study in UK. So reinfections can occur with the normal virus as well. It does not have to be a variant to create a reinfection. Only 80% protection at six months in the SARM study before all this started. Same way with vaccination. When these vaccination studies with Covaxin and Covishield were done, we got efficacies of 76% and 80%, hmm. which basically means 20% of the time, even before these variants, you can get infected after vaccination. Okay. What appears to be the case is that when you have variants, thus 80% might become 70%, the 76% could become 65%. So there is a drop in efficacy in getting infected. However, severity of illness is a different story altogether. How severe will the illness be? Right. And that's very well protected. Okay. So very important clarification there that a reinfection is possible and was possible with the past variants as well. So when you say that this is a faster strain, it is more rapidly spreading. Can we then say that this is more dangerous, has the potential to be more deadly? And could this new variant now that we're talking about the double mutation, like you said, could this perhaps fuel the third stage, if the third wave, if we are not prepared? Well, let's not get to the third wave quite yet. Okay. Let's focus on this current one. So the word dangerous has two parts. Dangerous to the individual and dangerous as a whole. Now, even with this virus, 617.1 or .2, doesn't really matter. The ordinary person who is infected has a very high, excellent chance of recovery. Okay. We saw that in Maharashtra. It's only when many people get infected at once, all of them requiring medical care, if they get timely medical care, they will recover. But in absence of timely medical care, because the system is so stretched, it becomes more dangerous. But as such, per infected case, we see more symptoms perhaps, but as such, the danger is not that much more in timely treatment. And the best time to assess that, Ritika, is on the way down. On the way up, okay. when the entire system is stretched, everything looks inflated. Right. On the way down, when things go back to normal in Maharashtra, things look okay. A couple of very quick questions. Can the RT-PCR detect it? Because there have been questions about, you know, false negatives that have been floating around. You're the expert very on, simple, on genome answer. sequencing, so there you'll be able to tell no us. There is no problem with RT-PCR detection. We have sequenced these variants. There is no mutation in the part of the virus that RT-PCR would miss. There is absolutely 0% probability of the RT-PCR missing these viruses because of a problem in RT-PCR. Okay. Now, the real sensitivity of RT-PCR has never been more than 75%. Hmm. When we say 100%, we are using RT-PCR itself as a comparison. Okay. On the seventh day of illness or the eighth day of illness, the virus is less in the nose and mouth. Hmm. If patients present late when the lung is involved, RT-PCR is negative at times. Okay. Uh, very quickly before we let you go, I, I have to ask you about two more questions. One on the increased demand for medical oxygen. Can that be linked to the variant? And more younger people being infected, is that also something that can be linked to the variant? Because these are both things that we didn't see in the first wave. 
Let me take the second one first, and there's a con there's an answer. It's confusing to us also, Ritika. Last time when these outbreaks occurred, schools and colleges were closed. People were not going to restaurants. Young people were not going out and mixing much. So even if you know severe disease was rare in young people, until you know the denominator, how many young people got infected? Because this time schools, colleges, everything was open. We will not know the answer to that. And the surface of it, it seems to me that people could have been infected either times. It is just that the world was more open. Schools, colleges were open. People were mixing and taking less precautions. Right. The second one on oxygen demand, same thing. We have always seen that about a few percent, 5%, 10% of people end up deteriorating. If many people get infected together, the total number of people requiring oxygen will be higher. However, Dr. Bhagav, DGICMR, in a study by ICMR has shown Hmm. that symptoms and breathlessness are a bit more this time around. Right. And the larger number of cases might be the real difference. Okay. A bit more, not that much more. All right. Okay. So that's important clarification on the new strains. Thanks so much uh, for joining us, uh, Dr. Agarwal. Those are some important clarifications that, uh, that you've given us about this new strain, helped us to understand it better. Thanks so much for your time. Thank you very much. Okay, we're also joined. How is the world really looking at this variant that's first originated in India? We have Dr. Peter Chin Hong, infectious disease specialist professor at uh, the UCSF University of uh, California, San Francisco, joining us. Big questions here in India are linked to this uh, B1617. I want to begin by asking you, you know, how do you understand it? Do the symptoms, the clinical manifestation of this differ from the previous strains? I think uh, data is emerging with B617 uh, as we speak. So that information is um, uh, basically still emerging. But what we understand in general is that it's more transmissible. Uh, so younger individuals can get it. Uh, it uh, causes potentially more serious disease. Mm -hmm. So compared to the regular COVID, uh, getting this uh, particular variant of concern uh, makes you sicker. And part of the reason is that if we extrapolate from other variants like this, uh, people have higher viral loads and you can keep viral shedding for much longer. So it makes it more in, uh, infectious as well as causes a higher dose of inoculum. There are also certain aspects um, of the Indian situation where we're emerging uh, new information about COVID's effect, for example, the cases of fungus infection like mucormycosis in patients with diabetes in India, I think that hasn't really been seen in many other parts of the world. So I think new manifestations, new risk with COVID in the face of this variant is constantly evolving. All right. You know, the million dollar question is whether vaccines will work. There has been a difference of opinion. Uh, the World Health Organization says it's uncertain uh, the vaccine efficacy against this new variant. The UK vaccine minister has just clarified, saying he's not concerned. How soon would we be able to gauge the extent of immune escape tendencies? Yes, yeah, so whether or not vaccines will work against the, this variant of concern, uh, B617, is still emergent. But in my opinion, I think most of the vaccines will work. Um, we know that one of the mutations in the receptor binding domain, which is very similar to the one in California, um, all vaccines work against that. And then the other one, which is similar to P1, the vaccines work against P1. There's some data that sh there is a uh, reduce in immune response to this particular variant in the face of vaccines, but we have such a large uh, immune repertoire that's really profound when you give a vaccine that that was also seen in the uh, B117 variant, but then clinically the vaccines seem to work. In California, at the end of the day, we have the California variant, which is similar to the variant described in India. And, you know, our cases are very, very uh, low right now, given our high rates of vaccination. So both taking the clinical component, as well as what I know about the biology of the disease, um, I, my hunch is that the vaccines will work against this variant.
Okay, well, let's sincerely hope, uh, Dr. Peter Chin Hong, that your hunch is correct. Thanks so much for speaking with NDTV. Uh, I want to move on and shift our focus to the other big development that we're tracking. From six to eight weeks, a second shot of Covid Shield will now be given uh, after 12 to 16 weeks here in India. The World Health Organization says get vaccinated four to six weeks after you've recovered from Covid. India now says six months. So is this new policy driven by scientific evidence or just by the logistical concern of vaccine shortage? We have experts from India and uh, the UK joining us. Dr. Veer Pushpa Gupta joining us from London from the National Health Service. Thanks so much for being with us. Dr. Om Srivastav, consultant infectious diseases, Just Lok Hospital also with us. Dr. Srivastav, to you first. Uh, you know, this, this change in dosing regimen, the third time around has raised a lot of concerns. What would you like to tell our viewers? Yeah, so uh, a very important question that you're asking. Essentially, you know, it makes a lot of sense because once you know this is the kind of impact that this virus is going to have on your patient's immune system, it makes only more sense to be waiting for the immune system to settle down before you give it a, a shot to say, okay, start having an immune response to it. So. When you've got an immune system that is not yet completely settled after after a major insult mm. like an infection like this, it's, it does not make a lot of sense to say, okay, the infection is over, take the vaccine in two weeks' time or four weeks' time or six weeks' time. It actually makes a lot of common sense, actually, to be able to delay taking your first shot because that's the time when your immune system, your patient's immune system, is likely to be able to recognize and respond to the vaccine, the first dose of the vaccine, and that the second dose should be delayed proportionately uh, after but, the first dose so that you have an optimal kind of an immune response. Dr. Shivasa, help our viewers understand this. If this if this evidence has been out there in the open, this isn't fresh evidence that co that's coming in. We know that it's already 12 weeks in the UK. Why has India taken this decision now? No, uh, see, uh, you know, evidence comes out in phases. Evidence comes out in in incremental doses okay. of what is the best time to be mounting a response. And that one country may be, may be a little bit ahead of others, but most times it has to be relevant. Whatever evidence you say that we are going to incorporate, it has to be relevant to your country. So, so India taking its own time to come out with this kind of a guideline, okay. I think that that's very robust because the evidence that is out now will stand the test of time and scientific scrutiny. Dr. So I, I, I don't see the point in in uh, in some delay, no no right. more than maybe a couple of months. I, I think it's a, it's a very important development and that only once you are sure that the, the, the timing has to be appropriate to the people of your country, only then you should okay. be formulating. Dr. Dr. Veer, Dr. Veer, you've already had a 12-week dosing regimen for Covishield. Two questions to you, one on you know, how has it worked in terms of reducing severity of disease and the spread of the virus? And the second question is, do you believe that those people in India who've got the vaccine either at 28 days or between six to eight weeks are at a disadvantage? Um, well, I'll go to your first question first. Uh, I think the UK has followed this regime for four or five months now, uh, ever since uh, they started the vaccination program. And it's um, worked very well over here. I think it was the first country to do this. Uh, looking at a population level, I think it's a very good strategy because you get to vaccinate more people. And uh, studies have shown that even with one uh, vaccine jab, people can get up to 70% of immunity. So I think they've been doing this for a while and it's worked very well. Eight to 12 weeks is the usual gap that we give over here. So it's good that India is following this now. Um, and I think it will help to vaccinate as many people as possible. And um, in terms of your second question, how does it affect the immunity? Um, I think the, the longer, as, as the doctor mentioned, the longer the dosing, the, there was a study that was actually published today right. uh, showing that if the Pfizer vaccine is also increased to eight weeks, right. then the, 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 the viral load, sorry, the viral uh, load goes down and the immune response goes up in patients that are over 70 years old by three and a half times. So, but the question so, then is, are, are people who've got it at the previous dosing intervals at a disadvantage? 
No, I don't think so. I don't think so because a lot of people in the UK as well uh, okay. initially got the dosing at three weeks uh, for the Pfizer jab. So I don't think that that's the case. However, of course, uh, this the study that was published today uh, by University of Birmingham is the first such study that co care, compares two different dosing regimens okay. uh, to see. So I think we need more more data to come out and see how different right. dosing regimens work. All right, so more data to see how different dosing regimens work. We are still coming to terms with the if effect of the vaccine. We still don't know when we are going to need the booster shot, if at all we are going to need one. We're going to slip into a very short break, but our panel of expert doctors will continue to be live with us on the other side as we take your questions on the coronavirus. The number there flashing on your screens. Call us and we'll have your questions answered. Stay with us. Vaigyanik Kya Na Baato Presenting Magic Convertible BMR Kyunki Har Food Item Deserve Kare Right Temperature Higher Inspired Living Take the vaccine, uh, cover your mouths and st stick around at home. That's all I can say. If the things are not good, things aren't good, you just we need to. We need to help the system to, to level things out. We cannot say system should only work and we don't do anything about it. Whatever the situation may be, it's me who takes care of my family. And for that, I trust only NetMeds. Check expiry date of the medicines, confirm the order and easy home delivery. My family and I only trust NetMeds. India's own pharmacy. All right, welcome back. Our first caller, Fatima, dialing in from Mumbai. Go ahead, ask your question. Yes. You know, I I was detected... Yes. I was detected... Hello, I was detected COVID positive in the month, early month of January. And subsequently, in March, I took a, a COVID shield dose. Now, it is said that subsequent to studies in, conducted in Canada and in the U.S., it has shown that only one dose is necessary as the dose that I took was a kind of a booster dose to my antibodies already formed. Now, if this is the case where only one dose is necessary, we could save thousands and millions of doses, COVID shield dose, because it has been found that... The, it acts as a booster and the second dose is okay. not needed. Now, I want to know, is it needed? Because we could save so many boosters, All so right. many doses. Interesting question. Dr. Srivastava, would you like to answer that? Uh, for patients who've recovered from COVID, is one dose enough? What do you have to say about these studies? Yeah, uh, it is an interesting question. But see, uh, there are two things I'd like to point out here. One is that once you have the infection, the antibodies that you develop, they need to be of a very specific kind of a antibody. That's called a neutralizing antibody. That means about 20% of the antibodies that you have after the infection must be neutralizing and they must be sustainable in your system. The fact that we don't know, we don't know as to what would be the percentage of your antibodies and how long they're going to last is going to then determine whether you can take the one dose or you need both the doses. I think that the studies that you're talking about, they are interesting studies, right. but I don't know if they are able to, if they will, if they will be able to stand scientific scrutiny because it is still early days right. in the period post-infection. So I think that for all practical purposes, you should stick to taking the two doses and not the one. Okay, important advice. So stick to taking the two doses even if you've recovered from COVID. Uh, BK Call, our next caller, dialing in from Jammu. Go ahead. Uh, good afternoon, doctors, and good afternoon, Rishika. I am 63 years old. I have I am asthmatic. Should I take COVID shield vaccine? Because co vaccine has given its advisory. They have said that people with allergies should not take co vaccine. Can okay. I take? COVID shield. Dr. Veer and, Pushpak, would you like to take second that? second question is, yes. my daughter is feeding her child. Should she take vaccine? Okay. Two important questions there. Dr. Veer Pushpak, would you like to take them on? Yes, I think the answer to both of them is yes. 
uh, you are you can take the Covid shield, which is the AstraZeneca vaccine, if you're asthmatic. Um, I don't think there's any advisory against uh, allergic reactions with the AstraZeneca. Uh, and yes, you can uh, give it to your daughter who's breastfeeding. Uh, there has been no contraindication to that at the moment. All right. Thank you, doctors, very much for joining us. I'm afraid that's all the time we have on the show. We'll be back uh, with more news on the other side. Stay with us. Thanks so much for tuning in. Thank you.